Hello, uh, my name is Konstantin, Konstantin Osipov. Uh, I am from Moscow. And uh, uh, I encourage you to start with me since uh, the sooner I finish, the sooner you get lunch. I think so. Uh, the topic for for my talk is uh, is uh, I'm, I'm going to, talk to to speak about the database first, and uh, it's uh, the database name is Toronto. Uh, Toronto uh, is a funny name because many people think it's Toronto like a spider, and many people are afraid of spiders, but it's uh, uh, Taran in Russian means. Uh, uh, battering ram, so a hammering tool which you break uh, gates and games and in ancient history. So, and uh, so it's a tool for breaking things initially. And uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, it's uh, probably the most scriptable database uh, you, you're going to find. And uh, so that's what, what I will be talking about. But first, wait. do you think it's, it has anything to do with? Uh, yeah, okay. So first about myself, before, before doing this, I spent a lot of time uh, working on my SQL and uh, Back in the time when it was a Finnish, small Finnish startup, and then I went through a couple of painful acquisitions. So I worked at a large corporations at Sun and Oracle, and uh, this influenced me quite a bit. So when I quit, I had a vision for a database, and uh, in the past five years, I am pursuing that vision. So and it turns out not not, not many people actually uh, share it. So. Part of my talk will be trying to convince you. So back in my SQL, uh, we had a very nice idea of pluggable storage engines. Uh, pluggable storage engines uh, give you this: you can have a common SQL layer and uh, can have different data engines which run beneath, and uh, that gives you different properties. Like if you want transactions, you you sacrifice some bits of speed. If you want like ACID, you you run in a DB. If you want cluster, you can plug in cluster. So that was an idea of an open architecture for a database. And uh, as we see now, uh, the uh, database market right now is, is 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 going in a completely different direction. You have a database for uh, for for numbers, uh, for rows of for time series, for a database for search, a database for big data, so you have many, many different databases. So when I started on Toronto, uh, I had this uh, idea that uh, why not make a platform, uh, make something that is easily customizable and uh, actually can handle many different things um, and uh, be, good, be good at many different things. So an ambitious goal and very few things are good at different things. But this is how, how it all started. And uh, you probably know this uh, saying that a database, like a disk is a new tape and a memory RAM is a new disk. Uh, how many people actually heard that before? A few. And uh, the reason is that the uh, size of the media and the response times, they grow disproportionately. So the size of a typical disk is now you know, a thousand times probably larger than it used to be, and uh, the response time is only maybe a hundred times, or or a little less, uh, quicker than it used to be. And uh, it is a little bit better with uh, uh, flash, but still flash is much, much slower than RAM. And even RAM nowadays is, uh, compared to cache line speed, is very slow. So, uh, so the second part of the equation was that uh, the future of, on, of everything uh, operational is going to be in memory. So that's uh, 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 all operational data, set, data sets, they are going to move to memory, in memory processing. Already, most of them already are, but uh, uh, 
uh, in a five ten years frame time frame we are going to have probably like ninety hundred percent. So uh, uh, the initially when the project started, uh, it was a, a small tool to make in memory data processing actually reliable and uh, performant. So that's how the rental started, and uh, when we we set a few goals, we wanted it to be fast, we wanted it to be, to be acid, reliable, and uh, we wanted it to be fault tolerant. And we spent quite a, quite a lot of time uh, working on just that. So I mean, most most of you guys are probably using the Redis or Memcache, but very few use it as a primary data store, right? Does anyone use use Redis or Memcache as a primary data store? They don't have a backend data store. You're not afraid of losing your data. No. no. <laughs> Maybe you're. I live on the edge. You, so, so? I live on the edge. Oh, you live on the edge. So, uh, so what we try to do is we try to make sure that stuff is durable and replicated in the first place. So you can lose a node and uh, it still it's so. Like maybe some some of you don't, many people also have this uh, idea that in memory database doesn't store anything on disk. It's also is a funny idea that uh, uh, if you store stuff in memory, then you probably lose it when you power off when you lose the power. It's not the case, obviously. Most of the mem in memory databases they uh, run run journal uh, journal write ahead log and uh, they. Uh, uh, make make an effort to make to compact it because write ahead log can grow you know infinitely if you don't delete old stuff and uh, that's the magic uh, for a memory database because you can append stuff to write ahead log quite quickly but once you have the goal of making it compact uh, you you have to you know think and uh, do magic so for example Redis uh, is forking and uh, uh, Saving a snapshot in a fork, uh, and we started like that, but we learned quickly that fork can introduce, you know, latency spikes into performance of an instance. And at this point, we do uh, MVCC in memory, so that you have, a, you know, a consistent read view of your database, which you use for operations, and a consistent read view, which you use to save a snapshot and compact compactify your database. So the first uh, uh, you know, a cartload of efforts were put into that, making sure the latency is always stable, regardless of your data rate, making sure the indexes are cache optimized and so on. So, uh, we, in the end, we got this, this, uh, this thing. We store message pack, which is a binary representation of JSON. We our indexes are very much cache optimized. So a typical uh, index block is 64 bytes. And uh, our, since I introduced in the beginning, we have an extensible model. We have different types of indexes. We have, at this point, we have four types of indexes. It's hash, it's uh, uh, a tree, a B tree in memory, a bit set, and a multi-dimensional spatial tree. So we can store uh, spatial that data in there, and it's up to 20 dimensions at this point. And uh, I think we are the only <laughs> database out there which supports indexing over multi over mul so many dimensions. And uh, we we do log free. Our, our data processing is log free. And there was this uh, famous paper by Michael Stonebreaker about the future of databases, where where he said that. Hey, why don't you uh, drop all the locking altogether? Because I mean, because uh, locking is take locking and everything else taking is taking like ninety percent of modern modern database performance. So the way we, we drop the locking is uh, in uh, uh, by doing that sort of architecture. Uh, we have a single threaded transaction processing. Essentially, the databases is multi -thread, multi threaded, but the transaction processes are single threaded. And uh, in that single thread, every transaction is running sequentially. So every transaction is, has a consistent view of data. So it's a serial view of data. We don't have uh, view problems. We don't have serialization problems because of that. And uh, there are other supporting threads. The threads that work with this, the threads that work 
the work with network and so on. So that's what we did, and uh, that's how we did it. Um, and we started to extend this uh, this block uh, uh, sort of unit uh, with uh, making sure it's not it's not just a data structure, you know, because uh, not you don't just store data as it put, get, update, delete. How much can you do with that? It's actually funny how we transition from uh, in distributed applications how we transition from. You know, we run in circles. Uh, in initially, the whole idea was to put all your data in MySQL because, hey, I want to scale your, my, my front ends, my web servers, and I want to have a, a single source of truth, and I want, want to put that data into the database. And then, hey, the single source of truth suddenly becomes, uh, you know, overloaded, and I want to put my cache in front of it. I have two sources of truth. And then uh, Memcache and uh, uh, my, my SQL get replaced with a thing called Data Structure Server, which is Redis. So you, 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 you shift your paradigm and you say, hey, I just want my distributed application to have a global data structure which I work with. And that's very nice. But then you say, why don't I move some business logic closer to, to my data? so that I can speed things up, I don't have to round trip to date all the time. And that's us. So we started to extend, the, uh, uh, extend this uh, system, and that's when we added Lua. And if you look at our architecture, uh, the Lua is here. So essentially, we turned the, our database engine into a Lua script. And this is the way we did it. This is how it looks. Essentially, it's a, it's a Lua, com we, we turn things around and we make, make sure that the whole thing is just a Lua interpreter. And the typical database, so you can view this as a database configuration file, you can view, view this as a database startup file, you can view, view this as a Lua script. So here you can create database objects, you can set up listener so that uh, you listen to your kind of connections, you can do configuration, reconfiguration. You can start background fibers and so on. So uh, um, we uh, it it did all start that way. We just at first we just added stored procedures, but then we thought, why don't we export our uh, uh, our uh, our internals? Into, into Lua, why don't we bind them and make them available to the program? So that's how we, that's how we did it, and uh, since the database core itself is, is built as most modern applications around an event loop, mm -hmm. we just made the event loop available to Lua, and all our green threads which run inside this transaction thread available to Lua, so that users can create their own threads. Uh, we have a package called Fiber, which is shipped built in, allows you to create your own pin threads, uh, inter-procedure communication, so that you can send messages. If these channels are very much like Go channels. Does anyone know Go channels here? Familiar? A few? Yeah, so these channels are just like Go channels, and uh, we have network I.O., disk I.O., uh, so you can work with files. We have HTTP at this point. And uh, in this conference, I learned that you don't have to do it all by yourself. And uh, you can actually uh, uh, use quite a bit of uh, community. So the, the problem with a any event loop-based applications like OpenRST, like us, like uh, Luvid, is that the, the, the authors they have to re-implement the entire world all, of, all by themselves. You have to integrate uh, this stuff into your event loop. And uh, since uh, since there is no way to do it, you know, in uh, application server independent fashion, you have to redo it all the time, which is actually a separate thing, which is I think plaguing the the community, not, not just Lua community, but generally the uh, the programming <coughs> languages communities. So uh, so that's that's the, the path we followed until now. The, in the end, we got. 
a collection of packages which we document. This is a screenshot from our manual. <coughs> um, so, mm, and uh, this uh, gets us closer uh, to the second part of my talk, and uh, in which I would like to demonstrate how, how it's good. Why is it? Why this concept of having a scriptable database server uh, which can run business logic is a good idea. Why? Why it can be useful? So, uh, pews were one of the first cases when our database uh, uh, was, you know, used, that its, its powers were, were used. And uh, if you look at a bit at the history of queuing, and actually the first queue engines, they were the database engines. Because, uh, um, so think about it this way. Uh, this, if you have one reliable component in a distributed system, you can make your entire distributed system reliable. Mm. So a queue can be such a component. And, uh, but to become a comp uh, reliable, a queue needs to, well, needs to be safe, never lose data, be fault tolerant, and so on. And all these properties have traditionally been implemented in databases. So, uh, and this is actually true about any distributed system. If anyone tells you that uh, it's possible to make a distributed system which doesn't store state persistence persistently, uh, well, I, I think either the guy invented something very smart or he's bullshitting you. So, uh, uh, so, in order to make a reliable system, you have to store data persistently in, multi in multiple places. And. Uh, if you look at most of the modern uh, queue servers, they go the other way around. If you, go at, if you look at Beanstalk, RabbitMQ, they start from the paradigm of, uh, of message exchanges, which initially are not, not persistent, and then they add persistency and fault tolerance. So we approached that from a different perspective. We said, hey, we have a database, how we can make a queue server from it. And, uh, 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 we had to do uh, things that uh, in our application server logic that make it possible to run queues. With uh, uh, let me just uh, <coughs> fast forward a bit and uh, show how it looks. Uh, th this is the persistency back home. This is where you store your, your, your data. Uh, space is our name for a table, and the uh, space is a collection of objects, of documents. So every, every queue event, every task is stored in a space. And uh, uh, when, you, when you put a task into a space, <coughs> a task can have different different uh, state, uh, states itself. So initially, it's the task can be already or delayed. So you need some sort of uh, timer processor to, to put delayed tasks to ready, to watch uh, workers to, to change tasks of, change status of, statuses of tasks which are, you know, uh, abandoned. For some reason, a worker took a task and uh, is not uh, working on it anymore or not responding. So besides the database logic for persistency, you need some sort of logic to track users, do uh, event-based programming, and uh, well, that's basically it. Uh, so one of the things we did uh, was uh, making sure we can actually track connections which work with the database. And internally, the, the entire architecture of Toronto is that it's all based on triggers. Our DDL is based on triggers. For example, you, our DDL works this way. You insert data into a system space, 
a trigger is fired up, which makes sure that uh, this, according to this tuple which you insert in, into a system space, there is an object that is created. So this is how DDL works in Postgres and in most, most databases, actually. With the, there, is a, there are system tables which store metadata, and based on these system tables, uh, you, uh, you, you, you have internal representation of that metadata, such as, data, such as views, triggers, tables, and so on. So we were already heavily triggered, and we added a few more triggers. First, it was triggers to react to connect and disconnect events. This is how it works. Uh, a connection comes up. We identify that connection. A connection has a session identifier. And we record that, that uh, session identifier in a separate table. If a connection takes a task, we assign session identifier to, of that connection to that task. We remember it persistently. If a connection disconnects, we run over all the data which is associated with that connection and put it back to, to ready state or to delayed state. Uh, another case which you need to take care of is, is, is uh, uh, I would say, non-resource intensive waiting. In a traditional database, take MySQL or Postgres, there is no way to identify the event, uh, uh, to wait for an event on, on a table. It, you want to wait when a table becomes empty or full or non-empty. Because you, you come for a task, you want a task, and there, there are no tasks. What should you do? You, should you do polling? Polling is resource intensive. So, uh, since we already have triggers, uh, data change triggers in Toronto, uh, it could be possible to, to use that, but that wasn't enough. You needed to wait, to, to safely wait for an event inside the database. This is why we implemented channels. A uh, channel allows you to get to pull, wait for a message on the channel. And until you wait, you you are suspended, and the user uh, there there are no resources which are taken. And when a new data comes, a trigger is fired. This trigger puts a message into the channel, and whoever is waiting in that channel is, is woken up. And. Uh, uh, this is the API that we got in the end. Uh, we like a lot being installed the API. It's, I, mean, I think uh, the uh, I mean, a good API is very important, and uh, just just making it right even for for queues it, it takes a lot of effort. So there, are, you can put a task into a queue. You can take a task. You can acknowledge that you have. Uh, completed the task and then the task is deleted. You can just delete the task anytime if you decide to do so. You can release a task, which means that you uh, no longer are, is, are interested in working on it, so somebody else should take it. You can bury a task, and burying is an is inter interesting property which is uh, important for uh, uh, a thing called poison, poison tasks. So imagine you have uh, uh, queue for uh, for JPEG conversion, and uh, when whenever there is a new file uploaded to your server, you put a task to a queue to convert it, or maybe add a watermark on the file on a JPEG file. Imagine someone uh, uploaded a file which uh, crashes your image magic or your other conversion tool. Typically, an amateur queue implementation, in an amateur queue implementation, you see this. Uh, there is this file which is uh, in the queue. A worker comes in, takes the file, crashes, the file is put back in the queue. Another worker takes it, crashes, the file is again in the queue. Now, uh, after a day or two, you have quite a few files and suddenly all of your workers are crashing and your events are not, not handled, your good events. So you need a way to identify these poison tasks and do something about them. And uh, uh, a good queue implementation allows you to put back a task, but for example, not do it immediately, not assign it to another worker immediately, but put it back with a timeout, with a delay, or put it back as a buried task, which is present in the system but is not available for any worker. And somebody else needs, needs to look at the buried task. 
and uh, kick allows you to uh, to bounce a few burial tasks to ready state and peak allows you to just look at the task without doing anything about it once so, but the key advantage of this thing besides fault tolerance besides full uh, besides persistence is uh, ability to do scripting since the entire business logic of the queue is implemented as a lower script on top of these triggers and persistency and, and uh, online configuration you can do any kind of queue you want if you don't like the business logic around queuing uh, that is uh, in you know in your in your queue your favorite queue server you can you can patch it you can monkey patch it uh, in our queue implementation we have four four queue types a simple queue which is a FIFO first in first out FIFO with time to leave then there is a queue for nested queues and nested queues are useful when you say uh, you want to index a website for example and uh, uh, you and you have a you know, hundred of workers but you you it's not a good idea to have all your hundreds of workers attack a single website with nesting requests so imagine you have a first task which is to index the front page of the website and then that task creates a bunch of subtasks which is to index all the referring URLs on that site and then a hundred of requests comes from all your workers and suddenly the uh, administrator of the site is woken up and uh, says hey I don't want these guys on my website and uh, your, your indexing no longer works so nested queues allow you to create sub queues and queues for a single website you can create a sub queue so that only one worker works on that queue and uh, so that's just the four types we created for us. And uh, here is a benchmark. Uh, this is uh, Intel uh, uh, E5 chipset, uh, third generation, 2620. 20, yeah, 2620. <coughs> is anyone familiar? Does this identifier give you any idea? But, uh, well, it's, it's not a very powerful Intel chipset, I would say. It's, uh, it's multi-core, but not very powerful. And uh, uh, the <coughs> performance measurements, uh, they are twofold. Uh, they have to be in uh, queue operations and they have to be in database operations. Because a single queue operation might incur many databases, selects, updates, deletes. So this is a single, uh, single threaded instance on a, and it's not utilized in all the cores. We typically run it in a sharded environment and I will show you in the next slide how we do it. So uh, uh, this is the QPS uh, for take and put. Uh, in the peak it's up to 8K. Actually if you have both uh, put and take it can be bigger than 8K per second. And it's uh, up to well, up to I think if you if you count all of that, uh, it's up to 90k database operations per second with persistence and replication. So uh, that's a single instance, but and typically you run it in a sharded environment, and uh, you run multiple instances. Uh, multiple instances uh, on a single machine. It's, uh, we are mostly single threaded, even though we use auxiliary threads. And uh, this is a live, uh, uh, well, from a few days ago, uh, from our, one of our live applications. Uh, these are queue operations, 20,000 queue operations per second, and in peak, and uh, you can see it. Since we are an online website, we we follow the users. The users come. We have more load, more load in our queue system. The users go to, to sleep at night. We have less load. So a single machine can give you up to twenty k queue operations per second. Uh, so this is basically it. Uh, this is. Uh, 
something I wanted to present, a couple of uh, closing remarks about the project. We, it's uh, been around for almost five years by now. It started as a database, it's a BSD licensed. We are on GitHub. Actually, I should have started by saying that on the first slide, uh, I'm sorry, there is the URL that you could try. It's, uh, it's online and it's a Toronto application. So since Toronto has HTTP, we are just running Toronto instances for you and uh, you can try them out online. And uh, so uh, sometimes our community, sorry, our community looks like that. It's uh, uh, iron workers in, 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 uh, in Europe. So, does anybody recognize that sort of work? Yeah. When we go on under underground to get iron, but uh, we would like our community to look uh, completely different. We have uh, a good following in Russia and. Uh, I don't usually speak at uh, foreign co conferences, so this is probably one of the first comings to, to a foreign conference. And uh, we have uh, deployments, uh, quite a few deployments in Russia, so you could uh, you could check that out. Uh, apart from the corporate sponsor, which is mail.ru, and uh, we are open to to any you know requests. Com Questions, uh, bug fix, uh, bug bug issues, as, as usual, as any open source project. So thanks. And, uh, if you have any questions, please. See, is using yes, we are using low uh, uh, Yes, Logit has this limit on the amount of memory you can use for Logit, but. Since we are in a memory database, which is on board, so for any excess, you just put stuff in the database. And uh, this is, of course, using our own allocators and our, our own... We have a, a library for fast, uh, single-threaded allocation without, fragment, without fragmentation and so on. So which supports uh, concurrency in terms of multiple views so that we can do snapshotting and so on. We had a lot, of, I intentionally exclude all my rant about Logit or Lua or whatever. I could, but it's not a good, a good thing to even say that. I mean, nobody, you could ask me why Lua. And, uh, we are uh, positively in love with Lua for many things and we positively hate Lua for many things. But it's a topic uh, uh, for, for it's completely different. What what page is Toronto itself reading now? Because I I think it was Objective C or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a mic. I was trying to steal your mic or <laughs> something. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's also was uh, it's been a funny journey because. We started as, a, as an Objective-C project, we like C very much, but we wanted some of the features of the more modern languages. And uh, unfortunately, uh, GCC support for Objective-C is uh, very bad, I would say. So we switched to uh, C, mostly and C++, but quite a bit of the code is written in Lua as well at this point, maybe 10-15%. Is, is low. No more questions? <laughs>